So, something really interesting is happening right now in tech. Something that most people probably haven't heard about yet, but it's going to change the game big time. We're talking about a pretty radical shift in the foundation of computing. Literally the hardware beneath everything we do digitally. The transistor. It's the fundamental building block of all modern electronics. Your phone, your computer, the servers running the internet, everything. And for over half a century, silicon's been the king of that domain. But that reign might be coming to an end. A group of researchers at Peking University just announced something that I think is going to ripple across the entire semiconductor industry. They've developed a transistor that doesn't use silicon at all, and yet it outperforms even the most cutting-edge 3 nanometer silicon chips from companies like Intel, TSMC, and Samsung. It's not just slightly better, it's significantly better. We're talking about 40% faster performance and 10% less power usage. That's like skipping a whole generation of Moore's Law. It's huge. The way they pulled this off is fascinating. Instead of silicon, they used two-dimensional materials, specifically bismuth oxyhalide and bismuth selenide oxide. These materials are atomically thin, like graphene, but with better semiconducting properties for transistor applications. They're part of a class of materials we've known about for a while, but nobody really expected them to jump so far ahead this fast. And the structure of the transistor is different too. It's what's called a gate all-around field effect transistor, GAA FET. That means the gate, the part that controls current flow, surrounds the channel on all four sides. In typical FinFET designs, the gate wraps around three sides. This new design gives engineers dramatically more control over the flow of electrons, which reduces leakage and boosts efficiency. But here's where it gets really interesting. This thing can be manufactured without needing advanced EUV lithography, the stuff that companies like ASML build and which is under strict export control. In other words, China just made a breakthrough chip that they can build using equipment already inside the country without needing Western tech. That changes the game, not just technically, but geopolitically. Because if you've been paying attention, you know there's been this big decoupling in global tech. The U.S. has been tightening restrictions on chip-making tools, software, AI accelerators, you name it. It's about strategic advantage. And China, in response, is doubling down on building a parallel stack. Everything from AI models to operating systems to fabs, this new transistor is like a key puzzle piece that might unlock real hardware independence. It's kind of ironic. Silicon itself is named after Silicon Valley, where the modern tech industry was born. And now, decades later, we're potentially stepping into a post-Silicon future, led, of all places, by researchers in Beijing. Necessity, as they say, is the mother of invention. When you're cut off, you're forced to find new paths. Sometimes that creates real breakthroughs because you're not iterating, you're rethinking from first principles. This is also a major reminder that scaling isn't infinite. For decades, we've been making chips smaller and smaller. 7 nanometers, 5, 3. Eventually you hit quantum limits, material limits, cost limits. You can't shrink forever. So, innovation has to shift toward architecture and materials. That's what these researchers are doing. They're not just making a better chip. They're designing a different future. But as with all breakthroughs, there are real challenges ahead. Lab conditions aren't the same as real-world production. Scaling up yields, getting these transistors to work under variable temperatures, stress testing them over long durations, integrating them into full chipsets, then into systems, it's a huge process. It'll probably take years before you see something like this inside a consumer product. But still, this is how it starts. Now, while that's happening on the hardware front, Something equally disruptive is happening on the software side, specifically with Huawei and their operating system, Harmony OS. I know, people in the West kind of shrugged when it first came out, like, oh, it's just a fork of Android. But it's evolved fast, and what they've built now is something quite different. Harmony OS isn't just running on phones anymore. It's making a bold move into PCs, and the early demos are actually really good. Visually, it blends elements from Mac OS and Windows, but with its own personality. The interface feels premium. The animations are fluid, and it's incredibly responsive. You can customize it like crazy, dock placement, widget behavior, multi-window support, 
It feels like someone actually thought about how people work and then built an OS to map in the ecosystem. That's where it gets really ambitious. Harmony OS supports a seamless experience across devices. PCs, phones, tablets, even smart home gear. You can move files, inputs, even your attention across screens. Eye tracking lets your cursor jump to whatever display you're looking at. It's like having one super device instead of a bunch of isolated machines. They've even cut ties with Android and Harmony OS Next. No more Android compatibility. That's bold. Most companies wouldn't dare do that, but Huawei is making a bet that they can create a fully native app ecosystem. And so far, with over a billion devices already running Harmony OS and massive backing from Chinese developers, it looks like the gamble might pay off. And all of this is happening in the context of a shifting global economic balance. China and Japan just sold off over $100 billion, zero cents, in U.S. Treasuries. That's not normal. That's not random. That's a signal. A big one. There's a growing effort, coordinated or not, to diversify away from U.S. financial systems. And that includes how countries think about their tech stacks, their currencies, even their food supply chains. Case in point, soybeans. China just canceled a huge U.S. order, almost 2.5 million metric tons, and rerouted it all to Brazil. Why? Because over the last few years, China funded Brazil's infrastructure, built out rail lines, expanded ports, invested in agriculture. They didn't just find a new supplier, they engineered one. And this is what we're seeing across the board, the rise of parallel systems, parallel financial systems, parallel internet infrastructure, parallel chip manufacture, even parallel operating systems. The world is fragmenting into spheres of influence, technological ecosystems that don't necessarily overlap. It's not a bug, it's a feature of a more multipolar world. So where does that leave us? It means the playbook we've been using for the last 30 years is getting rewritten. It means you can't assume your supply chains are safe, or your tech stack is secure, or your dominance is permanent. You have to keep innovating. You have to rethink from the ground up. Materials, software, systems, everything. That's what's exciting. That's where real breakthroughs come from. Not just faster chips, but different chips. Not just new devices, but new ways to think about computing. Not just iterating on what worked yesterday but building what the future actually needs. So, yeah, we're entering a strange, dynamic, high-risk, high-reward phase of global innovation. And if you're paying attention, it's going to be one hell of a ride.